Hello, and welcome to the CORE Preservation Week webinar on Introduction to Community Archiving Worship Workshop, or CAW. I'm Carrie Beyer. I'm a member of the CORE Continuing Education Committee, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Our presenter today is Marie Lascou. Marie is a graduate of NYU's Moving Image Archiving and Preservation, MIA, MIA at P program. She attended her first CAW workshop in 2010 and has been a member of the CAW core group since 2014. She is the audiovisual archivist for media nonprofit Crowing Rooster Arts and project manager for Regional Media Legacies, an MIAP project focused on hidden media, media collections on Long Island. She is also a member of the NYC-based XFR Collective. A few, a few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise, and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is C O R E C E 2021. We do not monitor the Twitter feed, so if you have questions for our presenters, please type them into the question box on your screen. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation concludes. And now here is Marie. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to all in virtual attendance. I appreciate your time today. Um, I just want to say a special thank you to the Preservation Week webinar and Core Preservation Outreach Committee and the Continuing Education Committee members for inviting the Community Archiving Workshop group to present as part of the American Library Association's Preservation Week series, Preserving Community Archives. Um, I really appreciate your communication and guidance through this whole process. Uh, so I am Marie Lascu, and I'm representing a collective of people that comprise Community Archiving Workshop, or CA. Um, Community Archiving Workshop is both the name of the all-volunteer group and the name of the basic workshop model we organize. So I will be throwing around the term CA in both contexts um, quite a lot. So I want to acknowledge that. Community archiving workshop is a broad term, certainly not invented by this group or owned by this group. And it might be more helpful when you see or hear the words community archiving workshop over and over during this presentation that you envision that it says a type of community archiving workshop or our version of a community archiving workshop. So what started out simply as a type of event organized around an annual conference has organically grown into a core group of volunteers and a tested and trusted event model that has garnered the core group generous supplementary funding and other types of resource donations, very naturally urging us toward more targeted funding asks, placing us in a positive transitional stage. This presentation today won't focus on vision boarding our future, but is instead meant to introduce you all to the basic history of our group and workshop model, related projects that have come out of continued organization of our workshop model. And then I'll focus on two current grant funded projects that stand as culminations of our work over the last decade. I very much hope that the outcome of this presentation will result in us hearing from people who've been doing similar work, hearing from people interested in organizing their own workshop, hearing from people who have other project ideas or all of the above. So let's start from the beginning. The person who easily takes the label of founder of our group is Mona Jimenez. Mona is a media art conservator and currently works on multiple projects as a consultant through Materia Media, which she founded. 
She has a background as a media artist and understood the need for long-term solutions in order to ensure the survival of media-based works early on. She began her advocacy for video preservation over 30 years ago. In the late 1990s, she was the founding director of Independent Media Arts Preservation, or IMAP, from 2003 to 2017. Uh, she was a co-associate director and associate arts professor for the Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program at New York University, serving as an expert on the preservation of video, digital media, and multimedia. 2004, she established the film and media section of the Barbara Goldsmith Conservation and Preservation Department in NYU's Elmer Holmes Wilkes Library. Mona began activist archiving in 2008 bringing together students, moving image experts and volunteers to help organizations inventory and describe endangered AV collections. The project became the model for community archiving workshops. In 2008, she also founded Audiovisual Preservation Exchange, or APEX, at NYU MIA, and with Kara Van Molson and AV Preserve, collaborated with colleagues at the University of Ghana in 2014 to establish an audio digitization lab focused on saving ethnographic audio. This is just a fraction of the projects she's been a part of. Mona has been an integral part of the media archiving community and she has always experimented with and promoted community-based archiving of media collections. I'm focusing on Mona here because she is the person responsible for introducing the model to every member of this group and is absolutely the reason we have all come together, stayed together, and been inspired. All right, so the workshop as we know it, we meaning the CAW core group, was organized by Mona in 2010 in partnership with Scribe Video Center in Philadelphia. She had intended to make this an official pre-conference workshop for the Association of Moving Image Archivists annual conference, but the proposal hadn't been accepted, and Mona organized the workshop anyway, because Mona does that. And she presented at the closing plenary of the conference. Her presentation was a hit, and members of the Independent Media and Diversity Committees, respectively, worked together with Mona to organize and sponsor the workshop as part of the conference by the next year. And since 2011, the CAW has been a pre-conference staple of the EMEA conference with continued support from the Independent Media Committee and EMEA as a whole. Um, I feel really lucky I was there at this sort of proof of concept moment. I was a first year student in New York University's Moving Image Archiving and Preservation two-year graduate program, um, MIAP. Um, Mona was one of my professors and EMEA was my first professional conference. I wanted to see what Mona was up to. I went to the workshop at Scribe Video Center where the entire second year class was volunteering their time. Being part of that event had a major impact and it's fair to say, especially looking back a decade later, that it absolutely changed the course of my professional life. Mona's entire approach to archiving, championing archivists coming out of the institutional archive and going into the community space to actively assist as needed and without the express intention of collecting, it opened up the possibilities of how archival principles, which I was still learning, could be applied and what kind of spaces I could do this work in. So to quote from an article Mona wrote about community archiving independent media, quote, a community archiving workshop is essentially a distributed model for what archivists consider the first step in collection management, gaining intellectual and physical control the material. In a CAW, experienced audiovisual archivists and preservation specialists are paired up with those new to archiving. They work together for a day to label, inspect inventory, and rebox a magnetic media, and in some cases, a film collection. Everyone's data is collected using a standardized spreadsheet template, and at the end of the day, the files are merged into one. In a CAW involving about 30 people, the group typically inventories 125 to 150 items, capturing titles, dates, formats, tape condition, and other information needed for prioritization. The CAW model seeks to help caretakers jumpstart preservation actions, 
emphasizing that the goal is not a better organized archive, although this is a peripheral benefit, but to enable them to quickly find the most important works in the collection. Much of the legacy of independent media production remains uncollected, and realistically, even when works are collected, only a small percentage of the tapes will be preserved. The data from a call gives caretakers information to begin the preservation process while the video playback decks can still be found, end quote. All right, so here's a list of past cause specifically in relation to the EMEA conference. So I'm including the Proof of Concept 2010, Philly call since 2010 as part of the EMEA annual conference. Um, there have been 10 calls in nine cities and we work with collections from about 15 different community organizations and a couple artists. Uh, additional cause associated with different committee members, but not necessarily the EMEA conference specifically, um, is about an additional five cause in five cities across four countries, Mexico, Japan, the Philippines, and of course more in the United States. And this is about six additional collections. This list doesn't include the cause associated with our IMLS funded training of trainers grant, which I'll speak about shortly. This is also not a definitive list. We're working to better document the web of cause <laughs> as events have continued to be organized outside of the ME conference by both call committee members and other interested parties. The workshop began with a focus on analog videotape. You may ask why video or why audiovisual media only? The first reasons should seem obvious, specialization and convenience. Mona primarily worked with audiovisual media. Mona has a background as a media maker, had access to graduate level students learning about audiovisual archiving, and had further access to professional AV archivists at an annual conference. The more collection material types you incorporate into this workshop model, the more logistical concerns you have, and especially when our intention is to teach new skills to volunteers with no experience, it is obviously easier to focus on one material type. So I am absolutely convinced that this model could be used for any type of material. Another motivating factor is that audiovisual items are often the most neglected material in a collection because of the lack of specialized knowledge and training and because of the complexity of preserving audiovisual materials. The wrangling of commercial hardware and software not at all designed for archival purposes. The additional infrastructure and management required on the digital preservation end of things. And, you know, there is like a, a lingering sentiment that information on AV media might not be as essential. AV media is often the special project for temporary staff or something an intern can deal with but the analog and their digital equivalents are in great danger of being lost due to degradation of original carriers, obsolescence of playback equipment, and lack of collective management in the always precarious digital realm. This workshop models an opportunity for advocacy work by professionals specializing in the long-term care of AV materials. Not to point fingers, but to rally stewards of mixed media collections or media creators to make them aware that you need to be proactive about this now. And here are the basic steps you can take to get started without a single change in your budget. So CA is truly a group effort. We are all over, spread out into four different time zones in and outside the United States. We come from a wide range of backgrounds and experience. Some work in traditional archives, others are from media centers, libraries, digital projects, and some are independent consultants. This core group was assembled, orga assembled organically. These are the people who keep showing up. As was mentioned earlier, when I quoted uh, from the article Mona wrote about community archiving, Typically, trained AV archivists partner with a local organization and or individuals to jumpstart the preservation of a neglected audiovisual collection with a day-long workshop at which all volunteers assess and inventory as many media materials as possible, while local volunteers gain hands-on experience to carry on the work into the future. 
This day-long workshop is not a preservation plan. It does not complete multiple preservation processes that were delayed for decades. The media is not preserved at the end of the day. This workshop is intended to be step one, starting an item level inventory of audiovisual items, an inventory that can be continued, completed, and utilized for preservation planning. But this workshop is also intended to be a bridge builder between local community members and professional community members, especially those in similar scenarios, but maybe they're at different stages of the same journey. You can share tips and resources, start and continue your own conversations. Tasks that seem too time consuming or complex can become manageable with support even if the support is simply cheerleading and commiseration. So we've generally begun planning for a call around four to six months before the EMEA conference. The first step is securing a partner organization with an appropriate collection. Once there is an agreement and a data set, basic event planning logistics commence. Securing a space with enough room, easily accessible, near public transportation, there's food for lunch, water and coffee, et cetera, et cetera. To plan a car, we first establish where, and that's usually based around the city the conference is going to be in. Then we see if any call members have connections in that city, or we begin researching organizations and cold reach out. We have a template outreach email we send to people, and depending on who responds and how follow-up conversations go, we establish the collection that will be worked on. Then the priority is space. Oftentimes, the local organization with the collection is able to provide that space, whether it's in their own organization or another local, local organization they're already connected with offers it up. This kind of generosity has been absolutely essential to our ability to organize workshops in so many places. Then call members will seek out supplementary funding if it's possible. EMEA has been very generous in this regard. These funds cover lunch for attendees, um, as well as refreshments. Sometimes it covers additional supplies for the inventory process. And in the last few years, um, there's been enough help to cover travel expenses for some members in need. All preparatory event work happens remotely. Not all members who plan a car are able to attend. We have roles more clearly established now in our documentation, but in reality, one person can take on multiple roles. Before the day of the workshop, we establish which call members will take on which role, who will present, who will collect spreadsheets, et cetera. We rely on the local partner for outreach to secure day of volunteers, but we assist with registration templates and event descriptions. We make sure needed supplies will be mailed to the right address, that we can access the space early enough for setup, and then we set a final meeting time. So the day of the workshop is always similar. Uh, the event itself is usually between six to eight hours, with maybe one to two hours needed before and after. One hour is probably fine. It's designed to allow participants to come in and out as they are available, but often people do stay for the whole event. Key call organizers are always in attendance. The event always begins with about one to two hours of presentation. We're introducing attendees to the basic history and structure of a call. We ask partners to present on their organizations and the specific collection we'll spend the day with. This is an essential component to provide contextual information that is intellectually and emotionally engaging. Yes, people are participating in community service work, and that's great. They're potentially learning a new skill and also networking. But the invaluable contextual information of a collection reminds all of us at every skill level why we are engaging in archival work, why we want to save this stuff or free the tapes. We then have an AV Basics presentation that covers a general history of film and magnetic media with a focus on physical makeup and common formats as well as common risks and concerns, basic inspection tips. This leads into a presentation on the inventory template to be used for the day, walking through fields and preferred controlled vocabulary for each field where appropriate. At this point, the template is being distributed and as a group, 
we walk everyone through inventorying at least one item, which is made possible by passing out collection items. A good deal of time is spent on this introductory work because it's important to have everyone on the same page before we let people pair up and begin the inventory process. At, the, at this stage, event organizers are available to answer further questions and sort of mill about the space as needed. Depending on what was planned, kind of break up the day, there may be a film inspection station demo or a digitization station demo. There may be tours of the hosting space or a screening of materials related to the collection. People tend to find their own grooves. A call organizer is assigned the task to compile spreadsheets and clean things up for the partner organization. We make sure all the partner's media items are accounted for. Call organizer leads um, sharing the final spreadsheet with the partner and answering any follow-up questions. So much of what I just spoke of is detailed here. Our online handbook intended to serve as both a walkthrough of how to organize your own call as well as tracking documentation of past calls. Uh, the creation of this WordPress-based website was possible with a proactive web savvy call member who will be here for the Q&A and um, can answer, or maybe explain more definitively when the website came about and what that process was like. Because for me at this point, <laughs> I don't remember a time without it. Uh, very useful. So another project that came about with generous funding from EMEA um, was the creation of a film inspection kit. It's available um, for checkout through the EMEA offices and it can be shipped to workshops around the country. We now use it every time we put together a workshop. I'll also add that three members of CAW, myself, Kelly Hicks, and Mariah Olinskas worked as a sort of sub subgroup of CA as the Community Archiving Collective for the Smithsonian Institution for 18 months, beginning in 2017, to evaluate 11 of their audiovisual collections, readiness for preservation, and to create a preservation plan for them. The tools which we developed for that project are being adapted to work with our partner organizations for um, the NEH and IMLS grant funded projects I'll get into shortly. But for those interested, more um, Smithsonian project information and the final reporting materials are public and available at the long URL on the screen. So this brings us to our first PAW grant funded project, Training of Trainers, sponsored by EMEA and funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, IMLS. Many members of the core group had been discussing ways to evolve our work beyond single day events. We wanted stronger documentation around how we operate to assist with making the model more reproducible. We we're also interested in targeted training around organizing and actually putting on a workshop. And it was clear to us that organizing workshops in locations where members are based allowed for more follow up work and stronger network building it was time to move beyond just the convenience of the annual conference. So um, we approached the IMLS starting with broad assumption that the majority of um, audiovisual expertise in the United States is based around New York City and Los Angeles due to entertainment industry hubs that also include degrees targeting the industry and even programs that specialize in film and video archiving and preservation. While there are amazing audiovisual preservation efforts underway in both public and private universities and many museums throughout the country, these programs are focused on those institutions' own collections. What the CAW group wants to do is support community-produced collections that are retained in the communities from which they were produced. To further illustrate our intentions, here again is this map representing where we have held cause in the past, primarily in cities where the EMEA conference took place. And uh, here is a map representing where call members in North America are located. Please take note of the particularly giant swath of neglected space. We began to think about how we could reasonably take the skills and tools developed over about seven years of running this workshop and get it out in a more sustainable way to a broader community. 
Once the group agreed that we should pursue the funding opportunity through IMLS, select members volunteered to work on the proposal. Some agreed to certain roles in the event that the project proposal was accepted. This included three members agreeing to utilize either their place of employment or connect a partner organization in the area they are based to function as a regional anchor site. An additional three call members would provide support for each anchor-based call member. On top of that, our member, Sandra Yates, who had been stewarding the call handbook website from the beginning, took charge of the development of a proposed online toolkit, which I'll elaborate on. The training of trainers or TOPS project was initially proposed as a two-year project. Between spring 2019 and summer 2020, 12 workshops would take place, three training of trainers, three-day workshops, each including a traditional call on the second day, nine calls in addition with each TOPS highlighting three participants who would then be supported in organizing their own call for their own organization collection. With a goal to serve about 12 organizations, train about 200 community volunteers, and inventory and inspect around 2,400 AV assets. Three national regions would be served. We would begin to serve them with the Midwest represented by Madison, Wisconsin, the Southeast represented by Nashville, Tennessee, and the West by way of Northern California represented by Sacramento. So each anchor site or hub would be responsible for hosting the training of trainers workshop and the workshops would be developed and organized by the anchor site call member with their support call member. They would be responsible for identifying community partners for the tops and the cause and they would be responsible for building and hosting a call workshop supply kit and a digitization kit which would be um, it was kind of like up to people to decide what to focus on, but it's usually either video or audio, focusing on one or two formats. And then they would also build and host a film inspection kit with the intention that all of these kits would be available for regional partners to use as needed. So let me quickly plug the actual anchor site organizations uh, listed as well on these slides are the participating organizations in each anchor site's training of trainers. Uh, Recollection Wisconsin, based in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, they are a consortium administered by WILLS, formerly Wisconsin Library Services. Call Corps member Amy Sloper connected with Recollection Wisconsin while working at the Wisconsin Center for Film and Theater Research. And Amy led the training of trainers workshops even after relocating to the Harvard Film Archive with the assistance of call member Jeff Martin. California Revealed um, is a California State Library initiative that helps public libraries, archives, museums, historical societies, and other heritage groups. Lucky for us, call core member Pamela Vatican is their director, and she was supported by none other than Mona Jimenez. Last but not least, National Metro Archives in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, the National Metro Archives at the Nashville Public Library launched its Audiovisual Conservation Center in 2017 and has actually been home to two previous cause which have had a major impact on the collection and helped to support the founding of the ABCC. And lucky for us, CAW Corps member Kelly Hicks is project manager for the National Metro Archives Audiovisual Heritage Center. We are very grateful that Nashville Metro Archives leadership was happy to participate in this project as an anchor site. And I served as Kelly's support for the TOT workshop and Mariah Ulinska supported an additional call hosted by Apple Shop. Part of the grant includes building a curriculum and online toolkit to share documentation and resources developed throughout this project, where the handbook focuses on the basics of a traditional workshop model and documents past events the toolkit is intended to first document the training curriculum developed for the TOT workshops in each region, as well as presenting the TOT materials as another reproducible model. It also functions as a resource for participants of TOT workshops at each anchor site. This is still a work in progress, but there's plenty of material to dig into now. 
All right. So in addition to the IMLS funded TOPS, the CAW group was thrilled to receive funds in 2019 from the National Endowment for the Humanities, NEH, to bring the workshop on the road in partnership with the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums, ATOM, to Indigenous and Tribal Archives in the continental U.S., Alaska, and Hawaii. Before I explain our second grant-funded project, um, I would like to provide some backstory. So a MIA community member, Michael Pon, who is the Executive Committee Vice Chair of the National Museum of the American Indian, expressed that he really thought that call would go over well at the International Conference of Indigenous Archives, Libraries, and Museums, which she often attends. So ATOM is an international nonprofit organization that maintains a network of support for indigenous programs, provides culturally relevant programming and services, encourages collaboration among tribal and non-tribal cultural institutions, and articulates contemporary issues related to developing and sustaining the cultural sovereignty of Native nations. Michael connected us with ATOM, and they accepted our proposal for a call at their 2018 conference held in Prior Lake, Minnesota. We were certainly ready to branch out since we're very comfortable with EMEA and felt it would not only be enjoyable and a new experience, but would also be a good test of our model. Can we pull this together as easily as we become accustomed to with the EMEA community? With funding support from EMEA, who once again believed in our efforts and wanted to build a partnership with this professional organization and community of culture keepers, four CAW members, myself, Amy Sloper, Mariah Ilinskas, and Kelly Hicks, organized the first CAW as part of an ATOM conference. Two other audiovisual archiving pals joined us, Rachel Matson, who's curator for the Treader Collection in GLBT Studies at the University of Minnesota, also a multi-CAW attendee, and Michael Pond, who had initially connected us. We had about 35 conference signups from each home and a couple of walk-ins. Our community partner for the workshop was the Medway Ganoned Library and Tribal Archives of Red Lake Nation. They were represented by two staff members, Jen Hart and James Cloud, both of Red Lake Nation. Our initial contact with Red Lake came from the library director, Cassie Leeport. Through the workshop, about 200 film, video, and audio assets were inspected, inventoried, and prioritized for preservation. It was most important that these archivists had the opportunity to work together. One of our greatest takeaways from this workshop was to learn that many of them felt particularly isolated and that opportunities for collaboration were rare. We did the workshop again the following year at the HOM conference in Temecula, California. Our community partners for the workshop were the Malcolm Museum, represented by Amanda Castro, the museum director, and Aaron Saubel, a museum volunteer whose family history is a part of the museum. We also partnered with the Northwest Museum of Art and Culture, represented by Tissa Matheson, American Indian Collection Specialist. We had um, about 26 conference signups from the Atom community. And from the Malfi Museum collection, about 129 video and audio items were inventoried and inspected, along with uh, 843 JPEGs and digital audio files inventoried. From the Northwest Museum of Art, 75 film, video, and audio items were inventoried and inspected. So that totals about 204 logged physical items for the day, which is in line with our average for these workshops. And so, ATOM received enough feedback from participants requesting something similar in more tribal archives. As if on cue, the National Endowment for the Humanities presented a funding opportunity. Similar to the application process for the IMLS grant, a call member or two drafted a proposal with guidance and input from ATOM staff. The project outline included the following. ATOM would lead a comprehensive survey of tribal organizations to assess the needs of tribally held audiovisual collections. Call members would work with ATOM leadership to identify sites and tribal archives at which to host a call through an application process. Uh, we intended six workshops to take place. Call members would finalize documentation and evaluation of the workshops. 
Atal and Ka would organize materials and resources developed and make them available on both the EMEA and Atal websites. And Ka would present on project outcomes at both the October 2021 Atal conference and November 2021 EMEA conference. And our start date for this project was March 2020. So our Ka workshop model is in person. Our two grant projects revolved around in-person work. Both of our funders immediately allowed for projects to pause, of course, and both granted timeline shifts by a year. I'm sure many of you in the audience have similar stories. Eventually, we began to check back in and to discuss what the next steps might be. By the end of 2020, it starts to sink in that realistically both in-person components of the projects would have to wait an additional year, and that is being optimistic. Does this mean the projects are over? The web-based toolkit component of the IMLS training of trainers has always been remote and will continue through the end of 2021. We had achieved all of the anchor site three-day workshops, and a few more trainee-led workshops were needed. The NEH project, as I mentioned, had not even begun before the pandemic hit. So what really helped kick off a revision of both projects was receiving supplementary funding through IMLS to expand the training of trainers into a new region, the Southwest. After a few virtual brainstorming sessions, we decided that both projects could be restructured to follow a similar template, now focusing on a single region. Revised plans were submitted to each funder and each funder enthusiastically approved. Uh, members Mariah Olinskas and Kelly Hicks moved forward as grant project leaders and began structuring and implementing the application process to create a new Southwest cohort. And so here we are. These are the participating organizations who, as of the beginning of April this month, will be working to kickstart inventory and prioritize work on their audiovisual collections. Just before this presentation, we had the second webinar intended to prepare them for inventory work. At this stage, all mentors have begun communicating with representatives from their assigned organizations. Our revised timeline takes us from April to December 2021. A call member has been assigned to each participant. Every member of the cohort will attend the same webinars and will work with a call member to guide them through the inventory process. Our goal is to get at least 200 individual AV items inventory per partner, and then use the adapted tools from the Smithsonian project mentioned earlier to assist with prioritization for digitization, as well as to create an adaptable preservation plan. Adaptable because it is likely that 200 items is only a sample of the collection for each organization. This is our current schedule for webinars intended to impart basic information to supplement inventory and inspection work. Um, and each representative will be performing that again with guidance throughout the next few months. An absolutely essential addition to this project is a training kit. We decided that the only way to come anywhere near the in-person training experience was for each participating organization to receive a similar training kit that we would utilize for key webinars, give participants something to practice on and have some basic starter tools to begin conservation work on their media. While not ideal to the calm model, COVID-19 necessitates that we pivot to deliver remote training. We believe that these training kits can help participants develop the skills and confidence they need to begin processing their audiovisual collections and provide them with some of the tools and supplies to do so. I'm really proud of these kits, and it's important to highlight that they were physically put together by a single person in their own home, you know, after a lot of back and forth suggestions from um, various comm members. These kits were funded through the grant, but some of the essential components, the media items supplied for identification and training, were donations from various EMEA community members. Call member Mariah Ulinskas had all of the materials shipped to her home. She screen printed each tote bag, selected and separated materials, organized and labeled materials, laminated film samples, 
and really put together something special. I told her I'm glad we have creative people in this group because I absolutely would have settled for a cardboard box with a printed out list of items and no swag. Um, so we should all be grateful for creative people who have the will to share that creativity to our benefit. So the experiment has begun um, trying to do some version of call remotely. So how did the first attempt at remote training of film identification and inspection go? Our first webinar utilized a version of the AV basics presentation we always give at the beginning of an in-person call, which again, this covers the basic format histories, common formats, inspection techniques and techniques and format risks. This first webinar included using the kit to have participants inspect and identify the film we provided. And this webinar was led by Kelly Hicks. Um, while no virtual activity can replace the in-person experience, and we absolutely wouldn't want it to, we are pleased to report that so far, the virtual reboot of our efforts seem to be going over well. I was just an observer during this webinar, but watching over 10 people spanning multiple states lift up a reel of film at the same time to hold it to the light in order to determine whether or not they had an acetate or polyester film base was really fun. So there will certainly be major project updates this fall as we continue through this process. We're currently unsure if we'll have a conference to present at, but our toolkit site will certainly be updated with more information. We're also brainstorming ways to continue moving our efforts forward and are working to carve out the time to think about what the structure of this group could look like moving forward. Having bigger ideas is no problem, but making sure our efforts are sustainable for ourselves impacts how useful we can be to current and future partner organizations. So for more information, please visit our websites or contact us through whichever social media avenue takes your fancy. And so, all right, we made it. It's time for the Q&A portion of this presentation. I'm happy to have two other CAW core group members joining. Sandra, Sandra. and Kelly. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, this is Kelly. What happens next? What happens next? Hi, um, thank you, Marie. Uh, this has been a, a really, a really interesting session. session. We now have time for questions. If you have not yet done so, please type your questions in the question box. Oh, um, I don't see any questions right yet. Uh, from the public, so but I have one that I want to ask. Um, oh, actually, we are getting some. Here we go. Here we go. Um, a laminate or encapsulate film. Sorry, can you repeat that? Yes, the uh, question was Are you laminating or encapsulating film? Oh, I'm gonna. I, I can. Tr I think that perhaps this question might be referring to our training kits, which have laminated samples of film. Um, that is not a preservation technique. That no. is. A, no. That is a lamination sheet that provides. Uh, those were like scrap pieces of film that provide. Um, that provide the people who receive the training kits with samples of different formats of film so that when we talked about like 35 millimeter or 16 millimeter, they knew what we meant and they could learn to identify those. But we don't, yeah, that's definitely, do not laminate your film collections. <laughs> yeah. It was more of a, a little, you know, we can you know, we can find any to be a physical, 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 but a reel of 35 millimeter is heavy and we didn't want to have to ship that. Although many of our trainees do have 
Um, they do have a lot of film in their collections, but this was purely to say, here are the basic film, film gauges you'll encounter, and this is kind of what they look like without them, without having to deal with like a cumbersome size. We have another question, and that is, were the digital artifacts preserved in their own state or transferred to a different, more stable media? So when we, hi, this is Sandra. So when we did digital objects during a call? Yeah, I'm assuming that's the question. Okay. Um, the the one that we did in Pittsburgh, they had a DVD collection and we copied it logically. So just the files off the DVD and we transferred those to a hard drive. And we also created an access copy using Handbrake. So um, the DVD files and also an access copy that was in PIC4. Okay, you, um, this has been awesome. It's more of a statement than a question. Do you need any volunteers or how can, um, how can others volunteer to help? Um, that's such a timely question because we've been talking about um, better ways to involve volunteers and like showing up for 10 years. So I would say if you are interested, we, that that email that's up there, I think it's communityarchiving at gmail.com, please email us. Um, normally, the easiest way for people to just kind of jump on would be, um, you know, we'd be planning an in-person workshop for the next EMEA conference, just like come on the planning calls and show up. Um, so right now, we are trying to be a little more creative on how to better involve the volunteers because we do want this group to grow and live on beyond us. So the short answer is if you are interested in being a part of a community archiving workshop in any way, please contact us. <laughs> also, um, as, okay, as we Marie, have a, you ready for the next question? Next question. Oh, Kelly was about to add something. I was just going to add that um, if you are interested as well, um, another, like like Marie said, a common way people get involved is that they help out EMEA or they decide that they know an organization that could really use a community archiving workshop and they and contact us to, to either help them set it up or see if there's any, you know, conferences or other events where someone might be around from CAW that could help them set it up. So I think think about, you know, opportunities in your own community where, you know, you might be interested in trying to set up a workshop and then also review our website, which has a lot of tools that can that can help you if you're interested in, um, you know, in actually like putting on a workshop. You ready for another question? Yeah. Um, one of the challenges, here it is, one of the challenges we have at the Lesbian Her Story archives is retroactively gaining permission to provide online access to metadata about videos because the original donors could not have anticipated the web and streaming. Mm -hmm. Oh. Um, is that the whole question? Yes, and there is actually a follow-up question right below it, which I think sort of answers it, but, you know, it's like, so basically, how do you handle copyright questions and research at these events? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the basics is, um, we're, you know, we're working, it's just one day and we're not addressing access. I mean, part of the work is like we're moving a collection toward access, but we always ask, and it's part of, it's an inventory field, we ask about access restrictions and copyright, um, if that information's even available. Um, but I think, you know, 
the important thing is to know which items don't have permissions to be made public yet, which items might require further research. And um, there's no, I mean, there's no easy fix for that, right? Um, sometimes you put things up and see if you get a takedown notice or if someone complains, but you know, you're trying to be respectful um, and you, you don't have documented information from a filmmaker. If you, you know, I, I guess it's like, I'm, I'm just kind of like stumbling around here, but if you don't have someone to reach out to, to ask for permission, there has to be research done. No, it's impossible to anticipate that things were going to be as widely accessible now as as it was even possible to make things accessible in the 1970s. Um, I could see a, an event being organized simply around trying to <laughs> at least begin the research of entangling this kind of work. Um, so it wouldn't be doing a traditional inventory, but it would be about gathering people in a space who are respectful of the content and kind of doing the work of, um, you know, if the community members who need to give permission are still available, could you bring some of those people together with the people willing to do the research and to officially get that permission? I don't know if anyone else has better suggestions. Better suggestions. Yeah, I think Marie covered it, but I, I will say I'm, I'm definitely not a copyright expert um and most of us don't have copyright experts on their staff so you're not alone and um but i can tell you where i've learned quite a bit about copyright and archives rights to preserve and stream which is at the association of moving image archives conference there have been a couple of copyright um uh presentations especially the the online presentation last fall um that um, some copyright folks mostly from the library of congress put on so i would definitely keep um i'm trying to find the resources that i learned from there and I'm, i'll keep trying um before this is over but there um there actually is again i'm not a copyright expert so or a lawyer however there's a little bit more freedom in copyright uh rights for archives than um i originally expected and so i would I would, there are workshops happening and panels happening that are super helpful. Um, and I found those um, through EMEA. So I'd keep your eyes out there too for further help. Okay, we have uh, time for just one little quick question. And the last question is also more of a comment. Uh, for these amazing AV training kits, how was that funded? Part of the IML, IMLS grant? Um, Kelly, maybe you know for sure, I think they were funded either only under the NEH grant or maybe there was funds from both, but, but it is from the grant. From the grant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was, we had, um, because, because of COVID, both of our projects um, were happening online through the NEH, funded by NEH and IMLS. The training kits specifically, I think, were funded by NEH, but also by sheer coincidence, um, because we were working with tribal archives and because our other project was working with archives in the southwestern United States, we ended up all working kind of online at the same time and in the same geographic region. So, um, so we're making some of those resources available to both groups, but specifically, I think the training kits were funded as part of the NEH grant. But I think there are lots of grants that you know you could fit something like that into. Yeah, in terms like if you want more specific information about like materials used and how that was plotted out, um, please email us. Uh, I feel like Kelly and Mariah like thought through a lot of like what should be in the kit and how it should be put in there. Like I, I do remember the discussion of like, you know, the like sh shipping 35 is really heavy, but like we really want people to understand the difference between 35 millimeter and 16 millimeter and eight millimeter. And I can't remember who was like, oh, laminate, 
like, let's laminate film. And we were like, yeah, that's awesome. And it was just kind of a domino effect of creativity. But I'm sure that, that there's like lists available. And um, I can't tell you how much the kits were. Um, I'm sure that would be helpful to know, but they were funded through the grant. Hey, uh, we, we do have a documentation post on the toolkit website that's the call training kits. So if you go to our website to the documentation, you'll probably see the bag picture in one of the cards. Okay, we do have some remaining questions that were submitted. Uh, our presenter has kindly offered to answer them in writing, and those presenters uh, and those answers will be sent to our attendees via email. Uh, we are glad that you could be with us today. You will receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions. Your comments are very valuable and help the core continuing education committee plan future events. The email will also include links to, this, to today's slides and recordings. Thanks again to our presenter, Marie Lascou. Thanks also to members of the continuing education committee, Joseph Nicholson and to Fred Ruland, Julie Reese, Tom Farron from the core office. The support they provide make it possible for us to present these webinars. CORE has other continuing uh, event, education events coming up, including two more webinars in May. The next webinar will be Wednesday, May 5th on Writing for the Web. Please see the CORE website to register or find more information on this and other upcoming webinars. CORE also offers web courses, which are four to six weeks long, two-day email discussions, and a new classroom series of workshops. Our next e-forum will be on May 18th and 19th, discussing advocacy for implementing faceted vocabularies in public-facing interfaces. Check the website for information on upcoming courses and discussions. Thank you all for joining us today, and this concludes our session. Thank you.